Hi, thanks for joining me for this episode. As a filmmaker and a podcaster, I use lots and lots of tech, and I am not a techie person. So I've started listening to a podcast that helps me with that. It's called Crossed Wires. It's a perfect podcast for people who know a lot about tech and love it, but it's also perfect for someone like me who wants to develop a better relationship to tech. Crossed Wires is hosted by Jay Bloom and James Billsbro, and in each episode, Jay and James explore the intersection of tech and ethics with some amazing guests. I'm so glad to have found Crossed Wires. It puts a human face on technology. I'll put their trailer at the end of this episode. In the meantime, you can find Crossed Wires on crossedwires.net and on any podcasting app. Do you want to change the world? So do I. On this show, we meet artists whose work is doing just that. Welcome to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. You know that phrase, all the world's a stage? We all have our roles to play in our lives and in the world. Do you ever think about what your role is? I want to share a story about someone who grew up feeling like an outsider. Her parents were immigrants to the U.S. Her first language was French. Was she French? Was she Algerian? Was she American? There was so much drama in her life. What was her role? And how might she make sense of so much conflict? Well, she found her role quite literally in theater. This was a place where conflict was necessary to tell a good story. And to her eyes, there was so much conflict in the world. But the magical thing about theater is that instead of her having to figure out the conflict all on her own, an entire group of people made up of writers and actors and audience members were working through this conflict together. And somehow, sharing this space full of darkness and light, transformation occurred, sending everyone back into the world with new ideas and new ways of seeing. This story is about Catherine Fiu. After about 30 years of creating work in global theater, Catherine realizes that she doesn't have to fit into any one family, any one city, or even one country. Her work has brought the world to the stage with plays that help us remember what we need to in order to heal. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. I'm so excited to be sharing the work of incredible women artists during Women's History Month. Don't forget to follow Art Heals All Wounds and leave us a five-star rating. It helps me bring more stories of these incredible artists. If you are a fan of theater, particularly theater involving activism and global exchange, you may very well already be a fan of the work of my guest today. For the past three decades, award-winning artist, playwright, and librettist Catherine Fiu has been traveling to conflict areas around the world, creating art that addresses human rights and social justice. Some of the topics Catherine's brought to the stage include immigration at the southern border of the United States, the cruelties of incarceration and solitary confinement, and honor killings, just to name a few. 
Catherine has done several plays about survivors of the Cambodian genocide committed by the Khmer Rouge between 1975 and 1979. In our conversation, I asked Catherine to talk about one of her plays set in Cambodia, a rock opera called Where Elephants Weep. We also talk about a new work she's developing about a survivor of the dirty war in Argentina. I'm so in awe of the work that Catherine has done. I wanted to know what keeps her up at night and what gives her hope. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to Art Heals All Wounds. Can you start by telling us who you are and what you do? Yes, it's great to be here, Pam. My name is Catherine Fiu, and I am a playwright who has been writing about human rights now for 30 years. I'm also a librettist. I write the words for opera, and I've had four produced operas. The last one, Orlando, was the winner of the Grauemeyer Award last year. And then in addition, I'm an activist and a co-founder of Theater Without Borders. Yes, and I've just been browsing through some of your work, really wishing I could see some of it, to be honest. Your topics, they're both global and personal. And I would love to back up a little bit and hear a little bit about you. Like, what about your life do you think got you started doing this kind of work? So I grew up in Southern California. However, my father is from France, and I can describe a little bit where he's from. And my mother was from Algeria. And so as a result of that, already I was experiencing many different cultures. Uh, French was my first language. And in addition, we spent as a family traveling extensively in Mexico. So some of what happened from the start is that because we were very close to that border, San Diego and Mexico, I could very quickly experience the economic differences that occurred as you just literally went from one place to the other in in one minute. And that was very intriguing to me, even as a child. My father is from a very rural, remote, poor part of France that's actually thought to be sort of the backwater of France, has a very bad reputation. And my mother is from this kind of Mediterranean uh, Algeria spirit. So you can already imagine the sort of clash that's occurring there. And also, I think it's very important to talk about war because both of them grew up during World War II. My father was actually in the part of France that was divided. And so they were part, him and his brother were somewhat part of the resistance. And his parents, my grandparents, took in a, a Jewish boy at that time. And then my mother also experienced war in her part uh, you know, of the world in, in Algeria. In addition, my father's father fought both in World War I and World War II. So mm. we, we really have their a lot of experience that has to do with people clashing and then recovering and then continuing again, which of course we all know is the state of the world. So all of that and the fact that I was an absolute outsider growing up, I, I really spent most of my identity trying to figure out where I might be fit in, what I might actually be able to have an opinion about even, because we, there was just so much floating around that that I think has influenced my sense of human rights in terms of really the urgency that I have always felt about it. Now, I think at this point in my life, in my career after 30 years, I can truly say 
that the urgency I feel is organic and palpable and that as an artist, because that's the vocation that I chose, I am a big believer that change is actually possible and that Mm -hmm. I feel like I've learned the tools to make that so and that under the umbrella of human rights, we can, as human beings in this experiment, you know, that we all all are living, really affect change. I think the human rights umbrella is a very useful one and a very hopeful one. Wow, that is so inspiring. I'm really curious to hear a little bit more, though, about how you found yourself, particularly this world of theater. When did you start gravitating towards that, and what was that like for you? Thanks for asking that. Yes, so the world of theater came to me in high school. I was an actress, and I must say that my first role was the fortune teller in Skin of Our Teeth, which, you know, she's an older lady, and I was like 16. I just (laughs) thought that was the pinnacle. For me, I had reached the director, our beloved Mr. Stewart, sitting on the lip of the stage, talking to the audience. And I honestly just thought, nothing can get better than this. And I came to it, uh, to theater through acting. And it was soon very clear that I was a bad actress. Uh, (laughs) not really equipped for many reasons to be an actress. However, I do believe that as a playwright, which is what I am, really nothing can equip you better to be a playwright than to have known what it's like to be an actor. Because you can't know what it's like unless you've tried it. And that means the lights go down and you are alone to do the job in front of an audience. And so I have a great love and respect for actors. I've always loved them. And that's how I came to the world of theater. In addition, I think that theater and playwriting certainly thrives on conflict. And um, I certainly had a lot of conflict in my growing up. And then that's how I began writing plays. You have so much work. And I'd like to just ask a two-part question, I guess. What kind of stories capture your attention to write about? And then also if you would just talk about some of them. Sure. So one of the topics that won my heart and and completely engaged me was a story that I had heard about a group of women who suffered from psychosomatic blindness after what they witnessed during the Khmer Rouge regime. And they were living in Long Beach, California, and I had read some articles, and the doctor, one of whom I went to meet in L.A., could see that their brain waves were working, but they said that they couldn't see. And so in terms of stories, that immediately, I think I am attracted to stories with a mystery, obviously, and also a story that I can really get engaged in for a long time because plays take a long time to write and then and operas actually take are even longer. And so I embarked on trying to kind of crack the code of what that could possibly be. And that led to a series of sort of peeling back the layers of an onion kind of thing where I would learn, I kept on learning more about the geopolitics, about the complicity of the U.S., about trauma, about culture clash, which led me to write a certain amount of plays about Cambodia and the United States through a series of of lenses. And then that, I think my, my, the stories in terms of what has led me in my career has been, as I mentioned, the urgency of the topic, and then also my further understanding and feeling 
for something and also my desire to make something sustainable. So in other words, to respect and honor the people that I've already written about and that have shared so much with me to make sure that I haven't ever hopefully just like did something and then ran away, you know? So that, right. that's, that's been a sort of a general mechanism for the way that I work. So when you are writing about a topic that you've found to be really engaging for you, are you saying that you actually then work with or engage with the people whose story it is as you're writing it? Yes, always. So with uh, the Cambodian story, I went to the Bronx and there was a refugee center there and I started doing an oral history with a group of Cambodian women who were there. And then uh, that went on for years. I then taught ESL there. And as a result of that, I started meeting refugees from Bosnia, which subsequently mm -hmm. led to a play I wrote called Dog and Wolf, which is about Bosnia. I also spent a lot of time I've you know, in Cambodia, obviously, and then also in Bosnia. I've, I've been to Bosnia many times. And it's an exploration that, that is uh, very expansive in terms of mm. one of the operating principles is listening for a long, long time. Because with, for example, the Cambodian people that I spoke to, I would listen and I would hear trends of things that I would hear over and over again. And that would inform me as to mm. certain things. The thing about Cambodia, I am really fascinated in it because in my lifetime, it's probably the first major um, I'm trying to describe it from how it struck me. I used to get all of these appeals, or probably I didn't, probably my parents were getting them in the mail, but I would go through them saying, help the victims of the killing fields mm, mm -hmm. and of the Khmer Rouge. And I, I think I was in elementary school. I would have to check the dates, but I had no idea. But, you know, that term, the killing fields, as a child, it's like, what could this possibly be? And then, of course, as I became older, I educated myself. But what I also find interesting is that you're not just spinning around a globe and saying, oh, I'm going to write about this place. You're writing about places where the U.S. has a very deep connection with what happened there. And I think probably a lot of people listening do understand the U.S. connection with Cambodia. But could you just briefly talk about our connection with what became a tragic regime there. Sure. So, yes, and then that also will bring up a larger context for me. Yes, so Cambodia was a neutral country, and there was, of course, the... During the Vietnam War. Yeah, it was so in the 70s. And so then a civil war started to happen pre 75. And basically, one of the things that occurred is that Kissinger and Nixon had started this secret carpet bombing, which they thought was going to alleviate some of the problems in Vietnam. And in Cambodia, it really wreaked great, great havoc because it affected Cambodia in many, many ways. And that created the imbalance that brought the Khmer Rouge to power. So we are absolutely complicit in what happened in Cambodia and have never in any way acknowledged that. And when I talk about this, I'm not talking about it as a way I mean, yes, I'm blaming the United States, but it's my intent is not to blame. I'm a deep believer that until we acknowledge the Native American genocide, until we acknowledge the slavery that has built our country, we look at the Ukraine right now. These are they're skirmishes and minutiae in terms of the real 
human rights canvas that we need to address. I believe that that's where I can be a change maker is because I have the experience and the belief that that is true. All of my identity and work is based on empathy. What I'm talking about is the, well, for one, the way that we put so much money into weapons and into arms the argument of talking about how much we're going to send to the Ukraine is, for me, not the right question. And it's very complex to talk about this, but I do think that if we look at the umbrella of human rights violations, then we will see that currently there's even a genocide going on in the Ukraine. You know, mm. so we need to look at the big picture. Right, right, right. Well, I think I saw that you had a play fairly recently, When Elephants Weep, that, was it banned? And can you talk about what that is? Yes. So Where Elephants Weep is an opera that I have collaborated with uh, Him Sopi, the composer, on, and we are planning to revive it. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it and then our plans for the future. And then also it's going to be shown on Broadway On Demand in April, in, right in time for the Cambodian New Year. Uh, Where Elephants Weep is a rock opera that mm. involves 27 traditional Cambodian instruments and a rock, a Cambodian rock band. And my libretto is about two Cambodian Americans who return to their homeland and a love story ensues. And it's an enormous project that speaks very much to the success of multicultural art. We had Broadway actors from New York and most famous Cambodian performers from Cambodia, all working together, a sort of thrilling example where if it was being sung or spoken in Cambodia, we'd have English surtitles, and then the opposite would occur. There was dance. And in terms of the libretto, it took us like, I would say, a decade to work on this piece together. So it was exciting. We did it in Lowell, Massachusetts, where there's a large Cambodian community. We workshopped it there, and the community was just amazing. They all came together to support it, and we did it at Lowell High School, which was really wow. great. And then it opened in Phnom Penh at the Chenla Theater, which is a very large theater, and we worked very hard to for its premiere, and it opened, and it was sold out, and just a really thrilling example of uh, theater and, and music. And then the idea was that it would be filmed and broadcast on national television, which occurred. It was, it was broadcast for the first time on a Cambodian national television. And then immediately after that, it was banned. So. so for someone like me, who doesn't really understand necessarily the politics happening there right now, why was it banned? Well, I think the reason that was given is the depiction and treatment of the Buddhist monks in the story, which at this point when we redo it, in 2024, uh, Sophie and I are talking about making some adjustments there. So that is one side of the story. The other side of the story is that it might have cast certain aspects of society in, in a negative light. That's so interesting. I mean, I, I have to ask, what was the treatment of the Buddhist monks that they gave as the reason that they were objecting to this play. Well, the other thing to say there is that Sopi, the composer, is a Buddhist, and Yang Sitol, who played the head monk, is a Buddhist. 
and every single thing that we did was vetted step by step so that it would conform absolutely to to the way that the Buddhist religion and and the situation works. One of the issues is that the character decides to, in Cambodia, you can be a monk, come and be a monk for a while, and, and then not be a monk anymore. It's not the same thing as other religions. And when he decided to do that, then he fell in love, and so he had to uh, end that. So that could have been one reason. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. That seems so unoffensive. <laughs> right. <laughs> but... Okay, well, so what are the plans for the future? I'm I'm curious to know, like, if you've gotten as far as, like, thinking of a location, you know, something like that, because I would love to see this. Oh, that would be great. Yes, so it will be in Cambodia, and the goal is this time to have it completely homegrown so that it is all performed by Cambodian performers and Him Supi is currently training the younger generation of people to be able to play these traditional instruments. So mm. it will be a sort of update of, of what we've done before. Well, that sounds very exciting. And I listened to a conversation with you and... Um, Mos Mosuchua? Yes. Is that her um, name? Musukua, yes. Musukua, okay, Musukua. And if I understand correctly, she's a politician and an activist who was exiled. Yes. Because she was outspoken about certain aspects of the government there. But the two of you had this amazing conversation about the arts in Cambodia and one thing that really maybe would seem quite obvious, but wasn't obvious to me before about the impact of the Khmer Rouge and the massive, massive killing of so many Cambodians on the arts. Yes. So 80 to 90 percent of the artists died during the Khmer Rouge regime. And uh, there are a lot of reasons th that are complex. I mean, the Khmer Rouge targeted intellectuals. They targeted people who wore eyeglasses. They targeted people whose hands weren't rough from working the land. And there were so many reasons why people died. But that is the case. And... Um, now, for example, when I had my play photographs from S21 done in Khmer in 2001, uh, there was an actress called Morm Sokli who played the one of the leads who is still teaching at the Royal University of Fine Arts and is one of the keepers of a certain kind of traditional spoken word theater, which is called poem theater, where she knows all many, many different ways of chanting many different kinds of versification of poetry. So those are the treasures that we need to continue to preserve. Mm -hmm. I feel like I could pick this apart forever and ask you questions because it is it's a topic you know for whatever reason that just really grabbed my mm -hmm. imagination when I was very young but I do want to talk about you have a newer play that I would love to ask you about can you talk about that sure so my newest play is a one-woman show and it was called under the skin and I've now changed it to How to Eat an Orange. And it is a one-woman play about Claudia Bernardi, who is a visual artist and uh, activist from Argentina. And it's just such a wonderful story for me because I met Claudia in Belfast, Northern Ireland, where we were working on a peace-building project together. And we 
lived as roommates for a month and she would tell me these stories. And I said to her just as a dream, I said, I need to write a one woman show about you. And I know the perfect actress to play you. And it just turned out that I was in fact able to write this one woman show for the actress in question. And now it's called How to Eat an Orange. And it's about the extraordinary life of Claudia. And it's a very poetic piece and a piece that I'm very thrilled to think about seeing on stage. It's going to be, it's going to open next year at La Mama in New York City, which is a theater that I've worked at before. And I just wanted to say that La Mama is a theater that Ellen Stewart started in uh, more than 50 years ago. And they are a great example, I think, of how the arts and activism and international sort of exchange can really come together. So that play is in the works right now. Right, right. And again, I think most listeners will know this, but can you just give a quick, well, since we're speaking about Claudia, give a quick idea of her activism in Argentina. And, you know, I I don't think, probably can't condense the dirty war like in yeah, right. two or three sentences, but, you know, just give us an idea of what her activism is about there. Yes. And also, I, I don't want to give away the, the play plot, but Claudia grew up in Argentina and subsequently came to the United States. She has a sister who is, she's very close to, and when you see the play, you'll understand more about how that worked. Her sister is a forensic anthropologist who's dedicated her life to uncovering much of what happened in Argentina in terms of the dirty war and the disappeared and also other and worked in other places. And Claudia has dedicated a, a lot of her life to doing visual art that is related to, for example, El Mozote was one of the places where she started in El Salvador, where there was a genocide and she worked to create a mural there with the people of El Mozote. And she has then gone on to do that kind of visual art community work in many, many places around the world, which is in fact how I met her in Belfast. So the play engages in a canvas that at the core is Argentina and this very mysterious sense of the disappeared, which when one was living and growing up with that, as Claudia was, we now know things that we did not know then. So we, she was experiencing it as it was happening out without exactly knowing what was going on. And then there's also, uh, with Argentina and with Claudia's story, some incredible things that have happened with justice in Argentina that speak very much to me in terms of the great hope that is in fact possible when people come together and say no. Even after the person dies, the crime is still there and is still... Mm. And so it's very, very uh, filled with hope in many ways. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I would love to go ahead and extend an invitation to you once this play opens to come back because I would love just to dig deep on the story of this play. I'd love it. Yeah. So I want to go back, though, to this question of theater. Mm -hmm. Why is theater the right place to really talk about these stories. I'm really curious about both for the artists, but then for the people sitting in the audience. I've heard from other people before you that theater can be really healing. 
And do you have your take on why why theater? Yes. Theater is a form which asks that people come together in a live community space and experience something that every time they experience it will be different. It will be a combination of the performers and the artistic work on stage and the very diverse and different audience that will enter on that particular day or night. And that energy and that phenomenon, as cliche as it might sound, I mean, it it really is on some level people say this in theater all the time it's live and but but that is really true that that especially now where we've been much more driven towards screens and towards uh, situations where we watch and experience alone this is something that is a phenomenon that that is palpable and, of course, has historically existed since the beginning of time with human beings. I went to a play where this happened to me recently. It was a topic that I thought I felt a certain way about, and I think probably it's a topic that many people might think they feel the same about. And I experienced the play As I was watching and feeling it, it was as if my whole inner makeup, my whole body, in in fact, my humanity, was shifting. And when I walked out, I did not, I felt differently. I had Mm. been reconfigured on some level. It's really interesting to think about. I've only ever been an audience member, but I've heard other people in the theater say that you're all connected. It's not just the performers, but the performers and the audience, they're all in it together making this experience happen. Yes. Yeah. But it does feel like you're taking us into this setting of theater to get us to remember or to reflect on something. Would you say that that's true about your work? Yes, and I and I think that one of the realizations is that remembering is a revolutionary act and that it has a duality to it because often with post traumatic stress or with with the experience of uh, human rights violations there are all sorts of triggers that can happen and we are always so careful with survivors to respect and to sustain them in any way we can and also without if we don't remember then we cannot change what we want to change And so that is why, for me, I place my responsibility in the survivors that that I know, because it is revolutionary to remember, and it is brave. And one of the questions you had asked is, what keeps me up at night? And what keeps me up at night is having listened to so many people who have been so brave, which was not easy, which it's not easy to be a survivor. How can we not honor that? How can we repeat the same mistake without listening, without knowing that some of those survivors or so many survivors have not only survived and but they have gone on to want to help and want to be generous. How, 
that that is why I, I believe that remembering is a revolutionary act and that and that theater plays a part in that. Wow. That's really incredible. Well, I do want to invite you back once How to Eat an Orange is up and running. But in the meantime, where can people find out about you and your work? Oh, thank you, Pam. Um, you, at my website, you just which is my name, uh, com or La Mama, which is in New York City, and they will be doing my play next year, so that would be a good place. And then uh, Broadway On Demand will be showing Where Elephants Sweep in April. And it's it's just a really beautiful, beautiful capture of a of a live experience. So uh, I am going to look for that. All right. Well, thank you so much, not only for being here, but for all of your incredible work that you're doing and that you're continuing to do. Thank you so much, Pam. It's a pleasure. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. It was such a treat to meet Catherine and to hear about two of her works. I'll leave information in the show notes on where you can get in touch with her, but a good place to start is CatherineFeu.com. I'm looking forward to having her return to the show after her play, How to Eat an Orange, is farther along, so look for that in the next year or so. In the meantime, I'd like to tell you how glad I am to have you listening today. Each person who finds inspiration from the artists on this show is the reason I do this, so keep coming back. Follow Art Heals All Wounds on your favorite listening app and share the show with a friend. The music you've heard in this podcast is by Ketza and Lobo Loco. This podcast was edited by Eva Hristova. As always, this show was recorded using Squadcast FM. Art Heals All Wounds comes to you from Oakland, California, on unceded territory of the Chokenyo Ohlone people. Do you have an interest in technology, but struggle with some of its less than ethical parts? Well, we've got the show for you. I'm Jay. And I'm James. And together, we're the team behind Crosswires. Every week, we bring you a new episode focusing on a specific tech-related topic with a guest or guests who really know their stuff in that field. We've covered things like backing up your data, how art and technology can be used together. We've taken deep dives into Linux, We've explored some cool hardware like the Valve Steam Deck. And if you're a bit nostalgic for the tech of your youth, we've got you covered with episodes focusing on retro computing like the Amiga, the Atari ST, and even good old-fashioned computing magazines from the 90s. Our chats are always relaxed, and we truly hope you'll find an episode you love. And maybe you'll even learn something new from our discussions. You can find our episodes over at crossedwires.net. And of course, we're in all the really good podcast apps and many of the really bad ones too. We hope you'll enjoy the show and thanks for listening.